And my final guest today is Theresa May's deputy, the Cabinet Office Minister David Liddington. He is the person leading the talks between the government and Labour over Brexit. Welcome, Mr Liddington. I suppose Morning. the first question is, what happens next? Are these talks going to carry on next week? And how long are they going to go on for? Months? No, they're not going to go on for months. They're certainly going to continue next week. Um, I had a good business-like meeting with John McDonnell uh, a couple of days ago, and what we've agreed is a programme of meetings next week on particular subjects uh, with the ministers and shadow ministers concerned getting together to talk about things like environmental standards, like workers' rights, like security relationships between the United Kingdom and the EU. And then we would hope to take stock of where we are um, as soon as Parliament gets back after the Easter recess. But I don't think that this uh, question can be allowed to drag out for, for much longer. I think the public right, rightly wants politicians to get on and deal with it. So do you have a deadline at which uh, a point at which you say these talks have now failed? No, I don't have a sort of a particular date ringed in the calendar for that, but I think there is a sense in Parliament and a sense in the public mood that uh, they want their politicians to get on and deal with this. And as government, we've always made it clear that while we'll do our best to try and reach a compromise with the main opposition party, it would mean compromise on both sides. Um, if that doesn't work, then what we will want to move towards is to put before Parliament a set of options uh, with a system for making a choice and Parliament actually having to come to a preferred option rather than voting against and everything. And you will be bound by that, whatever it results. Government said we will stand ready to implement right. what Parliament decides. Geoffrey Cox, your colleague, has said it wouldn't be a sellout or a betrayal to go for a customs union, and it has a particular legal meaning, that term, which is why I ask you again, are there any circumstances in which you could accept a customs union? Well, we think that it's possible to get the benefits of the customs union, which is what I've, yeah. I've just described, Without but it. still have a, uh, the flexibility for the UK to pursue an independent trade policy on top of that with other countries outside the EU. Labour's right. had, a, had, had a different approach. If we're going to reach an agreement on this, there's going to need to be movement from both sides. But I think, I, I don't blame you for asking the question, Andrew, but clearly you're, you wouldn't expect me to give a running commentary I, on well, talks I was, that are I was hoping in progress at the moment. Let's be very, very specific. Would you accept a common external tariff barrier? What we've made clear about is that the objective is to get no tariffs, no quotas, no rules of origin. And what we're exploring with Labour is whether it is possible for us to agree a mechanism that allows us to do that. So why isn't, it, why isn't it possible just to say no to my question then? Because I don't want to compromise uh, what is at the moment a space where we are testing with the opposition, they are testing with us, uh, particular ways uh, in which we could move forward. What's very clear is that when we leave the European Union, we leave the EU mm. Customs Union. Um, I don't think that there's any disagreement about that fact. The question is what type of customs arrangement, what type of customs agreement can you then construct that gives us the benefits that, that we both want to see? In her famous Lancaster House speech, Theresa May said, I do not want us to be bound by the common external tariff. But that is still possible now, is it? That remains the government's position, as uh, the I Prime know, Minister set out in, in Lancaster House. And I think what the, I'm trying to find is whether what, you would move on that position. What I'm, what I'm saying to you is that we are absolutely clear about the objective, which is no tariffs, no quotas, no rules of origin checks. See, and, but we still believe that it is possible to get an agreement on customs with the European Union that will allow us, when we get to this future partnership, to have, in addition to those benefits of a, of a conventional customs union, a, 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 can I, the freedom to do that independent trade policy with the rest of the world. Can I put it to you, that is a complete fantasy. We have spent two years plus trying to test if that's possible. It's not possible. We can't have all the benefits of a customs union while at the same time pursuing our independent well, trade policy. That we know, and yet it's still at the heart yeah. of these conversations. And, and the other thing that we know that's being talked about, because John McDonnell keeps saying so, is having a confirmatory referendum of some kind after this process. Your position is absolutely clear. No more referendums under any circumstances. That's well, it. It's not just what the government has said. If you look at what's happened in the House of Commons in recent votes, a referendum has come up. It's been voted on and it's been defeated. Just question whether there's a majority for it in the House of Commons. 
talked about two very, very difficult areas at the heart of these talks. Mm. There is a third one the Labour Party talks about a lot, which is, as it were, ensuring that whatever deal they come to you with you isn't simply torn up by a future Tory leader and changed. What they call Boris proofing. I can't think why this deal. Is it possible to Boris proof a deal? I think what you've, you've got the reality of, of the moment is that the House of Commons numbers are pretty finely balanced. You know, no overall majority for the government, no clear majority for any particular way forward on the basis of the votes we've had in Parliament so far. Uh, and that's not going to change. Um, I think what the government's already said is that we accept that in the next round of negotiations, Parliament will expect to have and should get a much bigger say in helping to shape the outcome of those negotiations. So we've already said that that, 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 that future deal will be made subject to approval by the House of Commons. So there will be a parliamentary lock over and that. And that's the nearest you can offer, because the other thing that's going to change is the party leadership of the governing party and the, the identity of the Prime Minister, probably, at that period. And that is what they're worried about. Well, in the, in the current Parliament, whether or not you, you have a new leader of either of the big political parties, um, the, the numbers in the House of Commons aren't mm. going to change. The balance in the House of Commons isn't going to change. Now, clearly, sure. the way our system works, if there's a general election, you get either a Conservative government, a Labour government with a, a mm. clear majority, you're in a different world at that point. But the numbers in the House of Commons are, are going to remain as they are. But beyond that, if I'm John McDonnell, Jeremy Corbyn, and I say, we've come to a deal, fantastic, we shake hands, and then I say, how can I be sure that a future Tory leader in the near future doesn't just tear it up again? What can you say to them? Well, th these are things that are being discussed. The role of Parliament is in, in the role of Parliament. You can't really in, say any, in being you can't give them any kind of promise. But it's the role of Parliament in how we go about the future negotiation uh, is part of the discussion that we're having with the opposition. It's something that different mm. opposition parties and indeed uh, members of Parliament on my own side have raised with me over the last couple of months. It's a perfectly reasonable thing for all parliamentarians to be interested in. Uh, but I think the the, the the blunt fact is the arithmetic of the present House of Commons is not going to change irrespective of whether either party changes its leader. I, well, we've mentioned leadership changes just now. I mean, you've been talked about yourself as a potential leader at some point and have been self-deprecating about it. Patrick McLaughlin, former chairman of the party, said this morning, defining ourselves as the Brexit party, pursuing the hardest form of Brexit with a parliament that will not deliver it is a recipe for paralysis in government and suicide with the electorate. Do you agree with him? I think that Patrick's right to say we mustn't define ourselves as the Brexit party. David Lally earlier on, you have come to an agreement, but actually you can understand why, given the nature of the injustice visited upon so many people, when you look at the amount of money the government is prepared to offer them, it is paltry. He's right, it's peanuts. Are you going to look at this again? Well, I'm sure this is something that Sajid Javid will keep under review. When you look at the amount of money that's being offered, um, if, you're, if you were made homeless, then for every month you were made homeless, if you've got all the paperwork, if you've got the paperwork, you get £250. If you've been denied access to NHS healthcare, you get £500. Is that, is that just? Is that reasonable? Are you happy with those kind of figures? I think that it depends upon each individual case, and I'm sure if there's evidence of injustice, that is something that Home Office Ministers will look at. Well, let, let me give you an individual case. Albert Thompson, who lived here for 45 years after coming to the UK from Jamaica as a teenager. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he was due to be treated in November 2017, and then all this stuff happened, and he was told in, in, when he was actually in hospital that it would cost him £54,000, and he was, his treatment was finally delayed for another six months. Somebody like like that. You know, you're a man with a strong moral core. He gets £500. That is a disgrace, is it not? Given his I, treatment. Well, I don't know the detail of the case uh, any more okay. than what you have okay. just read out to me, but I think that that was clearly on the account you've given me, Andrew, that was a disgrace. It was outrageous that that man was treated in that way. And I would expect the government to see justice done to him. Five hundred pounds. Is, that that is, but that is not just about a matter of financial compensation. It's about a matter of seeing that he gets the health treatment urgently that he needs. Do you think personally that was enough? I don't know the detail of the case, and right. I'm not going to comment okay. on on individual cases on air without knowing those details. Okay. OK, the European elections, we know the Conservative Party, for fairly obvious reasons, doesn't want them to happen, but they are now going to happen, aren't they? I hope not, because if we can take the withdrawal implementation bill through both Houses of Parliament and give effect to leaving the European Union before the 23rd of May, 
then that election process can be extinguished. But the, the, legal, the legal obligation on us was there from the moment that we remained a member of the EU beyond the 12th of April. And you have, in effect, legally hit the starting button. I just put it to you that once a campaign gets going, parties are spending money, they're coming in front of the electorate, they're on hustings and so on. In the middle of all of that, people are looking at opinion polls, you can't suddenly pull the whole thing halfway through, can you? Well, it, if, if we, if we it's leave... Extraordinary. The, well, it, it's, it's a matter of law. If we leave the European Union uh, before the 23rd of May, then we no longer have the right to send members to the European Parliament. So you would bring it to halt immediately at that point. But because we are, as of today, a member state of the European Union, we are under a legal obligation uh, to hold those elections, to prepare for them, and any UK citizen entitled to vote in those elections could, if we were not doing that, go to court and say, the government is trying to deny me my legal rights. So you're stuck legally. Let me ask it's you... It's a legal a obligation. Let me All right, David Lidington, thanks very much indeed for talking to us.